he has to go. So if you're going to go to the EGM, please vote in favour of the NEC motion. And in fact, I would encourage people to go there and do precisely that. No more fake news! No more fake news! That's the BBC! Good morning and welcome to the MBGA News Network. My name is Luke Nash-Jones and I'm here in Westminster. Now there's been a lot of talk about the future of UKIP, there have been many resignations and there have been suggestions that Bolton must go. So I'm now here to speak to Jared Batten who is one of the UKIP MEPs and was until recently the Brexit spokesman. I'm here with Jared Batten, who is a UKIP MEP for the London region. And I just want to quickly ask you, you've made some comments about Henry Bolton, the UKIP party leader, and you've resigned from your position. I just want to ask you, what motivated you to resign? Right, well, I resigned as the UKIP, Bre sorry, I resigned as Henry Bolton's UKIP Brexit mm. spokesman. I'm happy to continue talking about Brexit for the benefit of our members and the country at large. I resigned a couple of days ago because I... I called for him to go and to resign himself, so I couldn't really carry on as his spokesman if mm. I just asked for him to resign. No. And there's been concern about his recent affair and the way that was handled with the media, the lack of discretion perhaps. Um, do you think this harms the image of UKIP that we need to be the party of traditional family values? Well, uh, let's go b backwards a bit. First of all, we, the UKIP uh, NEC, the UKIP spokesman, the MEPs, what's, whatever, didn't make any moral judgments about what he yes. did. We thought, well, there's two sides to every story when a marriage collapses, you know, we're not going to take a, a judgment on that. Uh, and then, of course, we had the idiotic tweets and comments that had come out from his, or allegedly came out from his girlfriend. Uh, that was very bad. That put us in a very bad position with, for example, these comments about uh, Meghan Markle, um, which were really atrocious. And, and then, of course, what really what started to go wrong is his inability to handle this. Mm -hmm. You know, he's said that he's, he's ended this relationship, but maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, who knows. And then he showed that he was completely incapable of handling the press. He could have made his statement about it, said it's all over now, I didn't know about these quotes, that's the end of it, and I'm not commenting on it anymore. But every time he's interviewed, he starts talking to her about her again. And this went on and on and on. And finally, in the middle of last week, when the MEPs were in Strasbourg, a number of us, like um, uh, Margot Parker, his deputy leader, Mike Cookham, the assistant deputy leader, and others, all decided that we really couldn't support him as leader anymore. And we came out and said, you know, Henry, you've really got to resign. Uh, and then we had a vote in Strasbourg and uh, we voted seven to five from those present to tell the NEC that he no longer had the support. And I think that figure would be higher now if you were to take another vote. And you've seen yesterday that various people uh, have uh, announced their resignation as his spokespeople. So uh, it seems like he hasn't chosen the option to gracefully resign, but he's digging his heels in and he's going to take this all the way to the EGM, as he was discussing on LBC. How do you think the party at large feel about him? Well, from what I, I'm getting from emails, uh, text messages, from asking around, he prob he'd be lucky if he got 5% uh, of the membership on his side. I might be wrong, uh, but uh, at least when I checked a few days ago, it was 90% against him from the messages that were coming into head office. I think that's probably gone up because of the way this has been handled. Yeah, he could have said, enough's enough, you know, well, why am I doing this? Nobody wants me anyway, and, and gracefully walked away. He's given that option. He was given, he wasn't attacked. He was given the option of saying, very well, I understand that I'm not wanted anymore, so I will retire with some dignity, as much as he can muster. Uh, that position is still open to him, actually. He could still accept that the game's up, and rather hoped he was going to do that at four o'clock yesterday, when he announced he's going to fight it out to the bitter end. I know he's a soldier, but, it, it, you know, we've got, we've had Gordon of Khartoum fighting to the last man. Now we've got Henry Bolton waiting, waiting for the uh, UKIP EGM to launch an assegai at him, uh, you know, uh, in 28 days' time. And I mean, it's all absurd. He should go now, not put us through this protracted agony. It seems a waste of money, actually, but to hold an EGM. And many people on Facebook are talking about you being the next leader of UKIP. So I just wanted to ask you a few questions about what you see as the future of UKIP. Uh, many people are also saying that they think UKIP's days are over, that the Brexit referendum's happened, and supposedly UKIP has no purpose. How would you respond to that claim? What I did do was offer the NEC, uh, prior yes. to the meeting on Sunday, that if they wanted me to... I would step up as the interim leader to get us over this uh, period when we've got to go through the uh, next uh, local elections. 
and try to get things on an even keel. Mike Hookham also made that offer and I would have supported Mike and he would have supported me. And indeed, there's probably other people there that, that could do it. But it does have to be an elected person. Yes. It mustn't be one of the salaried bureaucracy of the party. It must be somebody who's actually fought an election, won an election, has a political uh, 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 platform from which to speak. So I'm very, very firm in that view. Um, I'm still willing to do that, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen now. You know, we're going to have this EGM in 28 days. If the membership endorse the decision of the NEC, then we have to have a leadership election. Mm -hmm. I have got very many people from the top to the bottom of the party asking me to go for the leadership. Um, my view is I've never, I have no personal ambition. After the referendum, I was quite looking forward to retiring in March 2019. Uh, I'm still looking forward to that. Um, but as I say, I've got lots of people asking me to do it, and it's about can we save the party or not. So I have to tell you, I'm, I haven't made up my mind. I'm wrestling with that idea at the moment. Okay. Should I do it or not do it? I'm, I, I'm very happy for someone else to do it, uh, who I think would be a credible leader, because that's what we need, a credible leader. Unfortunately, I don't see many people on the horizon uh, that could fulfill that. Uh, I don't think you'd have much competition. There might be one or two people, but... Um, so, regarding Brexit, do you think that UKIP has no purpose post the referendum? What do you think of this statement people are making? Oh, no, absolutely don't believe that. First of all, purely on the Brexit, we had the uh, referendum 19 months ago. Nothing's happened. Mrs May over there doesn't want us to leave. And I wrote a book about this uh, three and a half years ago. I published it, uh, The Road to Freedom, in which I explained in that point the referendum was only a promise anyway we hadn't even had it and I said if it happens the Remainers will fight a relentless battle to either keep us in or achieve a withdrawal agreement whereby we leave in name but not in reality and that is exactly what she is doing there now uh, she's talking about uh, a new security treaty that would keep us uh, in the EU's plans for its own armed forces keep all this uh, police uh, cr criminal justice uh, legislation like the European arrest warrant uh, a transition deal, which means we're going to get roped into the common fisheries policy. We won't be able to get out of that. So really, this is what she's trying to achieve. Or um, the more extreme Remainers are hoping that they can delay this long enough so the actual decision of the referendum can be set aside. So just on that point, UKIP is required. Because don't forget, the only reason we got the referendum is because of the UKIP electoral threat, which forced David Cameron to give the referendum. And much to his surprise, he lost it. And that was due to UKIP boots on the ground. Let's not forget that. We were the main people out campaigning. And, of course, Nigel Farage was the best spokesperson in that campaign. Even Cameron wouldn't go on the platform with him because Nigel knows his stuff on this and he really did a superb job in putting the leave case. Going forward from that, when I set, helped set this party back up back in '93, I wanted a party that I could vote for. I had no political ambitions then, but I wanted to be able to have a political party that I can vote for. When I retire... I want a political party that I can vote for. And it isn't going to be Conservatives and it isn't going to be Labour. And there are so many big things we have to look at uh, post-Brexit. How do we organise the economy so that it actually works for ordinary people? So how do we, go, for example, how do we have a reindustrialisation policy so that there are jobs for people? And, we're not, and where there are jobs, we're not flooding the country with cheap labour in order to undercut their living standards. We need to look at the national health, uh, housing, defence, all kinds of things, from a patriotic point of view. How does these policies serve the British people? Uh, because what you get every day is policies that don't serve the British people. And of course, the big thing in the elephant in the room, which uh, the political parties don't want to talk about, is the Islamization of this country, where we are constantly now bowing to Islamic ideology because more and more people are being brought in who are of that religious belief. And we have to have some very firm policies on that. And indeed, I've been writing about this since 2006. It's not a new thing. People who, who know what I've been doing or want to look at my website will find that I put things out on that, you know, as long ago as 2006, talking about it. So there are a whole range of things that UKIP can present to the people which would be popular to ordinary what I've always called out, you know, our, our constituency, our natural constituency is what I would call the patriotic working class. Now, that's a generalisation because there are lots of small business owners. Yeah. There are lots of people who might think they're upper class who would agree with what we, uh, you know, we've got, we've got earls in the party. Uh, we, uh, so there are a lot of people who would agree with us. But generally, I would say it's the patriotic population of this country. All they want to do, then, th these are not extremists. They're not racist. They're not xenophobes. They are normal people who say... A, con a government's duty is first to its own citizens, to look after its own citizens. We want to trade, 
be friends and cooperate with all of the countries of the world, not just Europe, and those are the policies we need. That's the kind of policies I'd like to see UKIP espouse. And I think even though we're in a bit of a, a hole at the moment, we could still regain ground. I think the big problem that UKIP's had, as you're only two, everyone's aware, is the um, electoral system, the first pass of the yeah. post electoral system. UKIP came first in the European elections mm -hmm. in 2014, uh, where it's a proportional representation system and people get what they vote for. If we had a system over there in Westminster where people get what they vote for, then there'd be lots of UKIP MPs now. Because you remember in 2015 when we were at our height, 12.9% uh, of the vote, uh, we got one seat, we got more votes than Liberal Democrats, Scottish Nationalists, they got more seats than us. I think it was 56, 58, something like that. We got one, and that was Douglas Carswell, God help us. It was probably a Tory plant anyway. <laughs> okay, so you have mentioned a bit there about the issue of Islamofascism, which concerns many people. We've had Anne-Marie Waters go off yeah. and make a new party. And you, you know, people said Anne-Marie Waters is the only person to discuss this issue, which is not true. You have, yeah. Lord Pearson has, many people have in UKIP. It's actually in the manifesto, so maybe some people haven't read that. But the UKIP has spoken out on this issue, and I think if you are the leader, that might draw back some of those people that have thought of leaving the party. Well, I've known Anne-Marie Waters for a number of years, and I've always liked her and agreed. I agree with a lot of what she says. I don't necessarily agree with all of it or the way that she says it, but, you know, that was true of anybody that you can think of in politics. And... She asked me to support her campaign. I said, I'm sorry, I can't, because I don't think this, if you were elected leader, this would be our primary policy, and that's not our primary policy. It's an important policy, uh, and we have to have it, but it's not the primary uh, identity of the party. Um, and then she ran, and of course she came second. And I was, like a lot of people, very upset that her supporters were, uh, inf it was inferred that somehow not, UKIP had got rid of a Nazi element. Well, you're not a Nazi if you're concerned about this issue. And I had people ringing me up that I've been out and pounding the streets with on by-elections who felt that they had been described in that way, were very yes. upset, and they've walked away from UKIP. I don't actually think her party will succeed because it's very difficult to start a new party now than it was when we did this a long time ago. We've got a party structure which can be built on. Um, you know, if she makes a success of it, well, you know, that's, that's good luck to her if she can do that. But I think it will be better if we make UKIP strong and those people can come back. If I'd have been elected leader um, last September, I wouldn't, what I would have said is, well done, Anne-Marie, you fought a good fight, you believe in certain things, don't necessarily agree with all of them, but I'll offer you a position as a spokesperson, probably on this issue, but keep it within the right bounds. We always discuss the ideology. We are not against people. Yes. We are against the ideology. And that's how we can approach this. And I think that's the way I would have managed it. That's absolutely right. Uh, and the other thing, I, I'm thinking very much of this article you wrote on UKIP Daily about the future of UKIP. Yeah. I was very impressed by what you wrote there, and I think you detailed it. Sorry. Uh, you wrote an article on UKIP Daily, and you mentioned this and other points. And I, I was very impressed by what you wrote there. I think that gives some vision to the party. And when I look at Henry, I see someone who might be very good at perhaps administration, and might be a wonderful chairman perhaps, but he doesn't seem to have the vision to take the party forward or the charisma. Uh, and you detailed their vision. But one of the points you mentioned is that you felt there was a bit of issue with the way the party's administered, a bit of an organizational issue. What do you think? should be done to take the party we, forward? We're getting a lot of uh, criticism now at the NEC mm. by Henry Bolton. Uh, yes. And in fact, Nigel was doing it last night on his show. The NEC represents the membership. And I've been to many, many NEC meetings over the years. Yes. I was elected member. I represented the MEPs on that. Now, they can be quite boring, I do have to say, and it can be quite difficult, but all committees are like that. I would like to see the NEC changed so that they, there are regional representatives or county representatives, however you want to, to, to cut the cake. But these are the activists. So they are people who are coming to report on how many members have I recruited, how many funds have I raised, what's my plans for the next election in my area of the country. So it, it's, it's actually a fighting force who are going away to implement the ideas of the, of the party and actually doing those very, very important things. And I think that the trouble is with the NEC, it's a bit too much of a talking shop. Uh, and of course, maybe some of that administration that they do can be taken away from them. And there's this idea of a, a kind of a administrative body of the party. So I've not got, uh, you know, absolute 100% concrete ideas on how it should be done. I'm not at war with the NEC. I'm not criticising the MEC. I'm just saying that now we need to very, very much focus on winning elections because we have to do what we haven't been able to do 
in 25 years, which is to get people elected over there uh, under a very, a very adverse system, which is not in our favour. Yeah. So what I wanted to, what I'd like the, whoever the leader is to do is to try and find a way forward on that. And we become more of a fighting force. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's lots of good people on the NEC. I know them. I've known them for years. Uh, so I'm certainly not attacking them. So scrapping the NEC would be a bad idea? I think to scrap it completely, yeah, what we want, as I say, is, is the representative of the party who are actually out there trying to make us win elections. And we do have to have a representative voice to the leadership and the people who run the party from the grassroots up. Excellent. Um, so just so uh, second to last question, uh, Nigel spoke about a second referendum. Any thoughts? Well, that was an absolute disaster. I tweeted straight away and I thought, why on earth would you do that? Cameron said, and people have been retweeting the, the section of his speech in Chatham House where he said, this is a once-in-a-lifetime decision. Yeah. Don't think we're not going to do it. We are going to do it. Whatever you vote for, we're going to implement, so you better make the right decision and vote the way you want. So he legitimised the result of that referendum. And when Nigel said, oh, maybe there should be a second referendum, he delegitimised what Cameron had done. And now this will be thrown back in the face of every lever, not just UKIP, but anyone from any one of the other organisations who's interviewed about Brexit, uh, their, their questioner or their opponent will say, ah, oh, but even the man who achieved the referendum says there maybe there should be a second referendum. Why do you want a second referendum? Actually, I think that if we had one, we'd win it by a bigger majority. But why would you then go down that road? I think it was a disastrous thing to say, and we have to combat that. Uh, now we have now our job's actually been made a lot harder. Yeah. And Brexit, anyone that wants to leave, whether they're UKIP or not, their job has been made harder now to actually make these people implement it who do not want to do it. The Commons don't want to do it. The House of Lords don't want to do it. So it's now that much bit harder. Uh, and just a final question. One of the things that interests me, perhaps because of the background I work in, is the digital side of the party. I don't think we do a lot with Facebook. Our YouTube following is quite low. Uh, I think we need to do more as a party, perhaps especially to reach out to younger people yeah. like parties in America and Europe to utilise the internet a lot more. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, years ago I used to say what we need to, forget the mainstream media because they're, they're totally against us. We need to find a way of leapfrogging them. I didn't have a clue how to do it and I, I didn't have the money to do it. And then Trump came along and did exactly what, exactly how he got elected. And I totally agree with you. I don't know how to do it because I'm not, it's, it's not my area. I don't claim any kind of expertise in that. But what I think the party should do, and of course we've got lack of funds now and funds are always a problem, but we need to find professionals who can say, what's your message, that's your business, how do we get that out there to as many people as possible? But of course in a way it's, all, it's happening anyway because when there was the march in London a couple of months ago of the Veterans and the Football Lads yeah. Alliance, it wasn't on the TV news, or there might have been a small segment somewhere, but I missed it. But I, I, somebody sent me, uh, Cliff Dixon it was, and a lot of people know Cliff Dixon, yeah, he, sent me a, he sent me a tweet about this with a photograph. I retweeted the photograph and said, why isn't this on the mainstream news? I got half a million views on that tweet. So there was a tremendous market out there, and I think a lot of it will be done spontaneously anyway. But yes, you're right, UKIP does need a strategy on this, and it needs somebody who actually knows what they're doing. And, and, that maybe is the hardest bit, finding somebody who can actually uh, implement a way of doing this. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity for us to get more people. Because you talk to anybody, uh, you know, in, Nor in you know, you go around and have a conversation with people, people don't understand what's happening, why it's happening, uh, but they are very much against it. These are ordinary people. You know, I won't say who, somebody came to my house last night, had a tremendous problem getting to my house in a car, you know, I don't know how long it took, they were stuck in traffic jams. And I said, well, we do need more people, of course, and with a, you know, a wry smile. And they said, yeah, absolutely on side straight away. They're not racist. They're not xenophobes. They don't hate immigrants. We want some immigrants, but they have to be people who are selected on the basis of, yes. uh, is it the right kind of person? Is it the right numbers? What are they coming here for? Not just open doors. Because the rate of immigration we've got now is totally unsustainable. You cannot add at least a, you know, a third of a million, if not half a million people, if the truth be told, every year. Where do you house them? How do you school them? Uh, how do you provide the National Health Service for them when they've never paid any tax? This is why things are grinding to a halt. It's unsustainable. And what other country in the world, apart from us and a couple of others, like Germany and Sweden, if you went to most, most other countries, uh, they'd think you were mad if you thought you could just turn up and get all the benefits and all the privileges uh, of citizenship. Yes. But we're supposed to think, we're not only are we supposed to think it's a great idea, we're attacked if we actually say it's a bad idea.
Uh, and that offers just through there. That offers just through there. The Institute of Economic Affairs said we need even higher migration. <laughs> well, <laughs> perhaps they should put a few of them up in their luxurious houses that I'm sure they own then, and they can help out everybody. I think they should. Uh, thank you. I don't know. Sorry, oh, I just one thing. I don't. Anything know, you want. I'm not an economist, but I don't know any economic theory that says you can only have continued prosperity by continued massive population growth. And in fact, what you look at is. Uh, the, the population goes up, but individual share of wealth is actually going down. It's not the size of the GDP that matters. Yeah. It's, the amount, it's, it's the, the amount of gross domestic product for each person. Is their living standards going up? Is their income going up? How do you achieve that? That's the challenge for governments. But you just increase the GDP, but actually people's living standards go down yes. because we are impe uh, you know, importing people who will work for cheaper wages, uh, so you're undercutting living standards while at the same time property prices go up uh, and it makes it harder to get the available benefits and housing. It's right, only the liberal elite benefits, maybe a few business owners who probably live in the Caribbean. And meanwhile, the average person is having to compete with more and more people to get a job. So by the supply-demand ratio, the wages drop. Well, this is exactly why I've been saying, uh, and I've been saying it for 25 years, our natural constituency is the kind of patriotic, ordinary person. And I don't mean at the bottom of the economic scale, small business owners. The EU legislation benefits big business. It doesn't benefit your average small business. And that's where most people are employed. I can't remember the statistic, uh, the, the actual statistic, but a vast majority of people are employed by small businesses, not big businesses. And what we have to do is make it easier for small businesses to expand and employ people. Because that's where prosperity would come from. And what's a tragedy is young people who can't get a decent job. I had a very privileged life. I had a job in a big company for 28 years before I was elected. Those kind of jobs are gone now. People can't have stability. They can't afford to buy houses. And all these people on you know, um, uh, sh uh, um, short-term contracts who never know whether they're a, going to get a pay packet the next week or the next month. They're the kind of people that we have to help. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It's very informative and very impressive what you said. And I would encourage anyone going to the EGM, maybe it's a bit cheeky of me, but I'll tell you to vote against Bolton. Well, can I add my voice to that? I've got nothing against Henry Bolton personally. I'm very friendly with him. Uh, I've tried to help him support him. His leadership is a disaster. He has to go. So if you're going to go to the EGM, please vote in favour of the NEC motion. And in fact, I would encourage people to go there and do precisely that. Thank you very much, and if you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel so you can hear more news. Thank you very much. Subscribe to MBGA News on YouTube. Together, we will defeat Sorosian fascism. We will make Britain great again.